Well, um, we should thank Leah very much. Mm -hmm. Thanks again. I, I want to begin, Bill, by asking you, um, what about that dance reminds you of Hannah Arendt? Yes. What are you, what are you saying? Uh, well. This is not entertainment. This is actually for me to decompress after watching my work and back the, in, front of, in front of the, in back of this man. Now, this is called honesty. This is trying to help Ro Roger and I come into this moment. Okay. Mm -hmm. Why are you, why are you laughing? Did you need to laugh? Hmm? Yeah, it makes you feel better. Hmm? Is it refreshing? Mm -hmm. And we're talking now as well. So we've already broken the rules of what the evening is, right? What's that? The fourth wall. Who, who told you about the fourth wall? Yeah, does it exist? Yeah, 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 yeah. It didn't exist for about 60 years, actually. Yeah. I'm worried if I have to dance. <laughs> dance, is the mo dance is the movement of people and things in space and time. That's my definition, not original. So play of ideas is also dancing. Mm -hmm. Conversation. Verbal dancing. Is also dancing. So you are dancing. I'm trying. So you were asking about the work? I'm asking about the work. Mm -hmm. um, you've said a number of times now that, um, in, that, that this work, which you composed, I think, in the 70s? Uh, uh, 78. 78, mm -hmm. around the time that Han Arendt uh, in the mid-70s was writing Life of the Mind. Mm. Um, uh, there's a chapter in Life of the Mind called Thought in Action, which is the title of this evening's program. Um, and you've suggested that the dance, in some ways, although you compo composed it or choreographed it before you read Arendt, in some way her writing reminds you of it in some way. I wish she could have seen it, because there was something she said about thought. Now. Um, she said, uh, thinking only happens when we leave the world of appearances. Yes. Which I thought, what in the hell are you talking about, right? So um, that, that was one response to her. But earlier, the work was made because I was the artist in residence at a boys' school. And there's all this anxiety around boys dancing. So they got a man, quote, that looked like a man, unlike those, quote, Joffrey dancers. This is what they said, those Joffrey dancers, they said to me yes. when I was given the job. Okay, so I looked like a man, and um, there was this thing that dancers don't think because they are creatures of the body. And when you're dancing, you're not thinking, you're just feeling, right? So I took that as a provocation, and I set out to make a piece that would actually, for me and perhaps for the audience, demonstrate that we never stop thinking. Now, and that's, as you can see, it's an arduous and crazy journey. The uh, piece is made in, as, you, as Leah demonstrated very well, four phases. The first phase is supposed to allow you unwittingly to watch us literally make a phrase. You see the, sh the decision she was making and she's got to learn it, master it quickly. The second phase, uh, and now this is, a, this is the virtuosity. Leah has mastered it to a high degree, and I think we want to even push further. How detailed can the description be? I say, imagine you're teaching a class. The second one, you're supposed to be doing the material and then reporting it uninflected as if teaching. The third one, do the material as purely as you can, but allow yourself to access regions of your mind and your psyche unedited. That's the trick. So you've got to be now, the, the ante is upped. You're trying to stay pure with what you've just built, and you're trying to now access what we call, is it thinking, this internal activity? that Hannah says can only happen when it is not outside. It now has to be public. The fourth phase, what you are doing affects what you are saying and feeling. What you are saying and feeling is allowed to change the movement. 
end of peace, start over. That was the idea behind it. Is it really possible to show the internal landscape while actually performing? The internal landscape. Mm -hmm. So is the, is the dance an attempt to externalize an internal landscape? Or, is it, or does one come first? Does the internal landscape come first and the dance is My point was that there is never a time when there is no internal landscape. And I think Hannah would have agreed, yes. right? Yes, I... Now, but well, then, except when one is thoughtless, which she says is yes. all too common. Which I think, and that's what I'm not quite sure if we pushed her enough. Is there ever a time when you are not thinking? Now, I'm an obsessively mental person. I think to exhaustion, and I'm an obsessive person, mm -hmm. right? Who is not? <laughs> I mean, what's happening when you brush your teeth? Uh, what's happening when you wipe your butt after going to the bathroom? Do you just disappear? I don't think so. I don't think anyone does. I think that's also what she is saying, is that um, we don't, uh, when we think, how does she say it? We don't think, da da da, we think about something. We don't think something, we think about something. That's right. And it's almost like an organ, like your lungs. The brain is an experience like, for her. It's not, it's not that you think Plato or you think mm -hmm. dance. Thinking is the experience of, as you, I think, put it in your own words, for her, it's the experience of taking something internal, some invisible, she calls it, mm -hmm. and um, putting it into metaphorical language and thus making it worldly, making it have mm -hmm. sense in the world. Right. Uh, it's bringing it to have meaning. But would she agree that the thought process is like the heart beating or the lungs expanding? If you have a brain, the brain, that's what it does. Yeah. See, I think this is, this is something that I wanted to talk to you about. Um, so when Leah gave her faculty seminar a couple weeks ago, she, she, she referenced one of your, I think, speeches or, or interviews, I'm not sure what it was, mm -hmm. and you talked a lot about your process and your work with your company, and it was fascinating to me. And one of the things you said was that your company was your machine, or was like your machine. Mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. um, and so you ask whether for, for Hannah Arendt, thinking is like the brain, thinking or the, the heart beating or almost like some sort of a pump or a machine. Mm -hmm. And it's, it, that's not the way she would normally have spoken about it. For her, thinking is what stops us. It's what um, sets up obstacles to the well-oiled machine that goes mm -hmm. on its path. Now, I would like you to continue this line, of, but I say that that is the problem with a great thinker like Hannah Arendt. Did she live in her body? <laughs> no, I'm saying that's, that's the a, other part. If you're going to say something like she that. She lived with her cigarette. Right. Yes. So I think there was a whole aspect of experience that that immense intellect did not allow her. And being a person of another time, mm -hmm. uh, I come through the experience of the 1960s. I come through uh, psychotropic drugs. I come through uh, promiscuous sex. I come through being black in a racist society. I come through many, many things which have made me have to at once be um, in my body, but in constant uh, exchange with, and often violent exchange with the world. Yes. Uh, so I don't, I, I can't, this idea, I think she thinks about thinking in the way people think. Uh, what did you say to me about um, music? We have harmonics. Well, we have I, the harmonic scale in music. There's a constraint mm -hmm. that one, one, thinks, one thinks of music that makes it that you can work with and around. Mm -hmm. with, 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 with painting, we have perspective. Um, even after abstract expressionism. Well, there's a... And harmonics, even after John Cage. Those are, those are constraints that can be overcome. But what I'm getting at is I think many of the definitions that she holds on to, she sounds as if she is a classicist. Mm -hmm. operating from what she probably feels are the highest precincts of human achievement. Yes. And then there's all of us bottom feeders down here, <laughs> right, that really don't fit in. So as much as I love her and I have yep. grown to really love her, 
I think that, that she was not pushed enough about actual experience. How does it really, uh, what is the evidence of your thinking um, okay. that she considers this invisible thing? Uh, uh, yeah, yeah. Well, let's, you, you, your, your experience that you come out of, I think, is very helpful. Mm -hmm. Hers, I think, was clearly um, formed through the early decades of the 20th century and then World War II. Um, which is not to say it stopped there, but, but I think uh, it, was, it was important, very important. I wonder if she had been a performer, if well, she would have had so the let's, same I was gonna, idea. I was gonna, so there's a, there's, there's a certain kind, she writes an essay um, in, uh, uh, in a book called Crisis of the Republic mm. uh, on the 60s protesters. Mm -hmm. She also wrote um, a preface, I mean, an epilogue to the book The Origins of Totalitarianism, which was in the second edition, but then taken out of all further editions on the Hungarian Revolution. And she book, wrote a book on the American Revolution and the French Revolution, it's called On Revolution. And, and so in these, all of these books, she's actually um, engaged with the experience of revolution, of upturning. And one of the things she talks about is how it is it to be human in a sense, to be free, one has to have the experience of revolution. One has to, f you have to, ha you know, she says it, you know, she quotes Jefferson in saying that every generation should have the experience of creating a revolution because that's when uh, in a certain way um, we, we have that moment where there are no banisters. There are no uh, measures. Mm -hmm. um, she says that the modern condition is very much the condition of what she calls thinking without banisters. All other times, and here's the classicism, right? And all other times, she says, have had measures, whether it was God or tradition or customs, whatever. We are the first generation, she says, who live without those fixed measures. And it's our fate for better or worse, and sometimes I think she thinks better, and sometimes I think she thinks worse, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but it's our fate to, in a sense, live without those banisters, and to live, um, and, and, and it's in that world where there are no banisters, where there are no limits, where the beating machine can take you to places you don't want to go. That's mm -hmm. what she experienced in World War II, right? People who get into habits, get into patterns, get into movements, and the limits get over, there are no limits that really, the moral limits, the religious limits, the political limits are too easily overcome. And thinking for her is the stopping, the standing up and getting lost as Socrates does in the symposium mm -hmm. and just stopping there. And but now you saw Leah thinking. Y yes. And it was, it's chaotic, isn't it? It is. Yes. Um, but, and she was, and I think particularly by her last run, you could feel that the problem, she was rolling through the problem and things were coming out, fragments, and, and in my way, now she's talking of a grand kind of, um, like a Jeremiah moment of thinking. And I, maybe it's because of the time that I, I'm a product of the second half of the 20th century, I asked the question, it seems that she wants to talk, and I think it's very important, that's what makes her a great thinker. She wants to talk about the human experience, the we, the human experience. And I feel, I wish she could, I would like to hear her write about I. <laughs> now, do you want to know about revolution, Hannah? Take your clothes off and walk in the street. Okay. Now, what does that mean? Now, now talk to me about change and talk to me about, um, ab ab about violent change. What, why don't you speak as a woman? Speak to me as a woman in relationship to a man and then I will understand something. You will understand there is a taste that's different than pulling way back to the discourse as understood by Plato, by Socrates, by so these great thinkers. What does it feel like? What does gravity feel like? What does it feel like to jump, to resist gravity? And then what do you think about it?
when you resist gravity. And I, now I'm, I'm, she's not here right yeah. now, but I'm, that is this person who I'm fascinated with and why and when I'm reading her, I often read it and I say, whoa, 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 wait, wait a minute, wait a minute. That's an assumption that I don't share yes. about what thought is and how it works. I don't even know if I, didn't she have some problems with the, um, in the way she critiqued the civil rights movement? Well, one of her, she wrote an essay um, uh, on Little Rock, on the, uh, on, on the Little Rock desegregation mm -hmm. case. Um, uh, and in the essay, um, she was critical of forced uh, integration um, in, in Little Rock. And she got heavily, heavily. What, what was her? Um, it, it's, it, it's, it's fairly complicated, but um, I've, I've, um, I think that there is, a, there, is a, there is an argument that she makes that's very interesting. Mm -hmm. There um, always are. There always are. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah. I teach it a lot, mm -hmm. and I find it a very helpful provocation mm -hmm. to the students. But the argument goes something like this. Um, the private world is important. Private life is important in some way. Not the private life where, you know, you're in your little house and you can play on your computer or watch porn or whatever it is that you do, mm -hmm. but the private where you become who you are. The private where you have your relationship with what's important to you, whether you look in the mirror all day or whether you pray to God or whether you um, dance down the street to your own beat. That private, it's important for you to be able to have a self. And that is the I I'm talking about. That is the I. And mm -hmm. she says that uh, uh, she makes a distinction between solitude and loneliness. Mm -hmm. Loneliness is dangerous. Solitude is essential because mm -hmm. it's only when you're with your I alone. But of course, you're never alone because you're with your other self, the mm -hmm. two in one, the thinking self, Socrates is daemon, right? But you're only yourself. You can only be who you are and enter the public, enter and appear and dance and choreograph and talk if you know who you are, and you only know who you are if you had a chance to actually develop free without social constraints in a private. What is more private, she says, than who you're going to marry or um, how you're going to educate your kids? Mm. If, there's, if, there's, if, there's any, if we're going to defend the private, which she thinks is under attack throughout society as long with the, along with the public. But if you're going to defend the private, what's more private than how you raise your kids? And we may think these people raise them well and those people raise them badly. And they raise them segregated and they raise them integrated. But if we're not going to give people the freedom to raise kids to be private and make mistakes and have their kids rebel against them, mm. we are going to so flatten society that we're going to take out the space where people become individuals. Exactly the I that you want to mm -hmm. encourage. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so she says, I'm not in favor of segregation. In other words, I'm not a racist. Uh, I'm not a racist. Ah. Um, but I am deeply, deeply committed to the protection of the private. And so she says, in the same article, she says, for the same reasons that we can't force integration in schools, we must allow multiracial marriage. She says in the same essay, for the same reasons, for the reasons that there are certain things which the state simply cannot interfere with if we're going to, and society, not only the state, cannot interfere with, mm. if we're going to hold on to a strong realm of the private where people can develop as individuals. How can you argue with that? And that's why she's such a provocative thinker. How can we argue with that except we do, <laughs> right? Particularly a Jewish woman. Yeah who has lived through the experience of Nazi Germany. I mean, I think the Hitler in his brown shirts had every right to say, um, these people are outsiders and yeah. we have a pure German culture and it's very intimate to us, very important. We should be able to decide who is a German, yeah. where they live, what work they do. Um, what, how was, I, I understand she corrected this argument. I mean, I don't, it, she actually. She, she never, I mean, so she, she took a number of critiques for it, uh, mm -hmm. and she basically ref refused, said that they were all wrong. The only critique she ever accepted was Ralph Ellison wrote her a, sh a short letter, who used to teach at Bard, um, wrote her a very short letter in which he, 
he took issue not with that part of her argument, but at one point, so what, what motivated her essay was a picture she had seen, I think in the New York Times, of you know, a little, I forget who it was, a little uh, girl, an African American girl, crossing the line with the soldiers there protecting her. Is this the brown? The brown versus the... No. The, 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 excuse me? Yes, yes, right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so she saw this picture, and one of the things she wrote about in the article was how, how, how it was wrong for the parents to let their children fight the parents' battles. That she said, I remember when I was a young Jew in Germany, right, it would have been, it was, it was, it, it was, it was, it was irresponsible for the parents of this little girl to put her in the position of having to cross into this militarized environment. And so she said that in as part of the article. And Ralph Ellison wrote her and said, you don't understand that part of the African American experience is to learn uh, to be a mark, to sacrifice, and that this is not, this is actually a good lesson for the, for the little girl, not a bad lesson. And she wrote him back and said, that's the first critique of the article that I accept, and you're right, I take it, you know, I stand corrected. But she never takes back the sort of more general mm. uh, yeah. point and, of the and article, I as believe, far as I know. And believe me, you know, it's an important point she makes, but um, back to floating the tongue, floating yeah. the tongue was created in a way to uh, demonstrate something that I think is valid, that I think the mind never stops doing this thing that I call thinking. Yeah. And, and um, she and I might disagree She on was that. confronted with Adolf Eichmann, just to take one example. Mm -hmm. And she saw this educated, somewhat educated man who ran a high up, you know, fairly high up position in a bureaucracy of Germany, just talk and talk and talk and talk and talk about how he was trying to help the Jews and he was trying to get them out of Germany. Mm. And it was cliche after cliche after cliche. Right. And this is what she calls the banality of evil. W but what she says is there are people who can talk and talk and talk and talk and they're not thinking. Mm. They're using worn out phrases. They're using, um, they're, they're relying, you know, we, you, know I, you, you said brushing your teeth. Yes, you think. And yet, you know, the more we are texting and listening to music in our headphones and, you know, going on our way, there's a way in which we do live more and more sort of... On automatic? On automatic. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Machine, mm -hmm. right? Um, you know, this, where are the times when we can stop and reflect? I mean, people say, I need a time out. You know, I need, I need to get away from the, the machine that keeps me answering so many emails a day that I don't have time to actually think about what I want to do, right? You know, and we were talking about Julian Assange earlier and the WikiLeaks, and here's a man whose dream is that the entirety of the world will be out transparent in public, right? Everything you say and think should just be out there mm -hmm. for someone to search and read if they so want. All hierarchy, all secrets, all barriers gone. Mm. And that's very much the trend and sort of the, the, the push of modern society, technological society. And she is confronting that and say it's getting harder and harder, ever rarer, to find people who can pull themselves out of that. You know, it sounds um, uh, strange that for a woman who is so anti-feminist, it sounds very much like a room of her own, right? Uh, Virginia Woolf, isn't it? That the, and which already has problems, but it's truth. How, many, how much of the world right now is starving to death, even as we speak? Yeah. How many people are like busting their butt just to get clean water? Yeah. And, and yet, so with this way of, of uh, speaking, those poor people never have time to think. That's right. And therefore, those of us uh, who have the economic means are the ones who actually are thinking, which leads me to the question of how does she, in um, uh, the, the human condition, she talks about the notion of action, mm -hmm. uh, about uh, that in the, cl in the classic sense, uh, things like economics, things like uh, even social justice, those sort of things about, uh, are not as important. Yeah. You need a class of people who don't have to worry about how they're um, going to be fed, who don't have to worry about cleaning their toilets, who don't have to carry water, who don't have to bear children. That is a class of people who actually are the ones that are, are performing what is truly action. Isn't that, and I, do I have it correctly? 
it, it, it's, um, it's, it's a critique that's been often made, and, and it's not, you know, she, she often idealizes the Greek polis mm -hmm. and these people in Greece who were able to do nothing but enter the agora and debate and talk because they had women and slaves at home to... And these people tend to be men. At, well, well, they had, they to, had to be they, men. Yeah, at, yeah. At, Greek at, citizens at, were only at, men. At this time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but but I, I don't think... Um, I, I, I don't think that's, you know, what she's saying for the modern age. She's not mm. saying we should have a, a class of people who have servants and slaves at home to do... And not what she's saying, but the implication is um, what is really the, 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 the true project of humanity exist at a level of intellectual engagement that the majority, according to what I'm understanding, the majority of people, because they're so busy busting their butt yeah. just surviving, they don't think. I don't, I'm not sure that's true. And, and one of the reasons is, is because she's not, she has no, she has, she's actually quite suspicious of the claim that intellectuals think more than, what should we call them, peasants at one point or workers. Mm. Um, you know, she, she talks a lot about how it was the intellectuals who were more adept at justifying uh, going along with Hitler and the Germans than it was, and often the people who most were able to resist and see clearly the moral problem were not the intellectuals. They mm -hmm. were often uh, people from the lower classes or people outside of the, the mainstream. In fact, often what we're taught as intellectuals is how to rationalize. Mm. Well, once you rationalize, you can rationalize anything. What what she's interested in is not intellectuals. What she's interested in is thinking. What is thinking? Stopping. Well, who can stop? Mm. Well, a farmer, right? Who doesn't carry his iPod with him or her every day and can go home and be with the kids and stop and think. Mm -hmm. um, might think more than a high-priced whatever who carries their work with them wherever they go and is never actually out of that mode. Well, you know, I have a, in, in my companion and I have a ritual in our home, which maybe comes from my involvement in Eastern religion, but it's not that anymore, that whenever we sit um, at dinner, there's always what we call a moment of silence. Now, this comes from work that I did with people dealing with life-threatening illness, a uh, piece called Still Here, and um, there was a woman who was a, 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 one of the, we, we would speak to experts around the country in various communities, and this woman said it all started, the problem started when birth and death moved out of the home, she said. Mm. Now what I heard her saying was that there are no longer those marker ritual moments. Now, so whenever we stop and we take hands, it is, I'm not praying. I am trying to center my breath, but I'm trying to, well, it's a little different, but I can imagine that we need a time every day that's a ritual time where we stop and we allow ourselves to, you say, think. Others would say, clear the mind. Yeah. Uh, if we accept what I said about the mind being this organ that moves, maybe when you clear the mind, it does its work uh, better. And things, I know I'm looking for inspiration for a work, it's that moment when I'm brushing my teeth that suddenly something bubbles up to the surface. Oh, there's a solution mm -hmm. because I wasn't trying to do it. I, I, think, I, think, that's the, I think we are in a, an agreement there. Right. Yeah, I miss her. I wish I, uh, I had known her. I wish that um, a, a person like that, I'd like to see them, I'd like to see them deal with modern dance. You know, I'd like to see, uh, when something like a process work like we just saw mm -hmm. a work which has no 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 desire to do anything other than put you in front of something like someone pointing and say this is what fire looks like not teaching you how to to melt or smelt or make metal not teaching you how to cook but let's show i wanted you to see what fire is and this is what that dance is um, it is not designed, as I was critiquing um, the, the two young choreographers today, and you and I talked, well, no, it wasn't you and I, I think it was you, sir, right? Um, about the choice, he was saying to me, well, I thought you maybe would get up and you'd like say, well, this movement, that movement, we talk about specific movements, 
And I wasn't sure if I could do that with good conscience because oftentimes when I make movement, I'm not, I don't know what it means or why I did it. Is that a good thing or in dance making? Every movement should be made with an intention or is the movement almost like the thinking that we saw Leah doing and is that valid? I don't know if Jackson Pollock in throwing that paint and letting it do what it did, if he in fact had a design before he started. He probably didn't. He was actually accessing experience. This, that, that, isn't that what the idea of uh, abstract expressionism was? That this is a record of an experience? Mm -hmm. Here is a record of it. It is not, so ask, explain each drip to me. You know, right? Uh, it seems to be beside the why point. Why did you move your hand here? Yeah, why, <laughs> yeah. Why did you move your hand here? Yeah. And why did you do that extra little wiggle like that? You right. know, uh, now those are those things past thinking. In a way, the wild man in me says, "Yeah, they're past thinking." You know, uh, yes, we're thinking, but there's something that uh, the machine, this animal, if you let it go, it will be like watching clouds, and they're beautiful, and they don't have to explain themselves. That's the, the great promise of abstraction in dance. Oftentimes it results in flabby, pointless <laughs> uh, <laughs> indulgence, right? But sometimes when it hits it, it's like, I'm looking at a flame. I'm looking at the clouds changing. Yeah. And that's, that's its own val validation. And interestingly enough, as we were talking about just before we came out today, mm -hmm. um, her husband, Heinrich Blucher, was uh, involved with a series of uh, of, of abstract yes, painters, that's what I and they yeah. had a number of. Mm -hmm. they, they, I mean, to the extent that they were interested in in the visual arts, they they did hang out with a number of abstract artists. I don't think she was um, at all uh, critical of uh, abstract art. Mm. The, the 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 movement in art that she decried uh, often was expressionism. Mm. Um, and, but abstract need not be expressionist. It can be an expression of some truth. What didn't she like about expressionism? Uh, the eye. Mm. Um, that, that, it's, uh, that, it's, that it's simply an expression of, of my feeling, uh, my internal feeling, mm. uh, and not of uh, a common, <laughs> uh, something that would be, uh, have, have a purchase for mm -hmm. a wider, uh, a wider, that would compel, um, uh, a plurality of diverse, interesting, often opposed people to say together, yes, mm -hmm. right? The uh, whole idea that there is some taste that is right, even though there's no rule for it. That there's some, in, in a work of art, that's good is not just my feeling or your feeling. Mm -hmm. It's, uh, well, in Kantian's, in a Kant's term, a universal feeling. Well, there's uh, the universal word, isn't it? Yes, yeah. but one that has no rule or, yeah. or mm -hmm. we can't provide any reason for it, and yet mm -hmm. it's, there's an, it's an expression not of my own internal, but of something common to us all. And I'm, uh, I can't resist this quote um, for the dancers in the room. If you don't know this book, it's um, by uh, um, Klotsky, K-L-O-S-K-S-K-Y. Yes, uh, it's Carolyn, uh, Carolyn Brown's husband, right? Is that true? No, 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 no. Um, pardon? Klosti. Do you know the quote I'm about to give when they were asking him about Merce Cunningham working at New York City Ballet and um, to Lincoln Kirsten? And Lincoln Kirsten, as you know, a famous curmudgeon uh, who supposedly hated modern art, yeah. um, although I understand he had Brancusi's. Uh, <laughs> They, he, uh, they asked him about this event, and he said, um, East is East and West is West, and never the twain shall meet. And then he waxes even more erudite, and he says, the modern music, the modern dance, like the modern music and the modern painting, suffers from what Baudelaire described over 140 years ago from the decrepitude of art. Art not at the service of the de-selfed self. Mm -hmm. Now that is, in my mind, that is what the classicists, how the classicists stick it to us, <laughs> right? 
In other words, you are operating in a domain that has no banisters. Yeah. And who in the hell do you think you are? Well, but she would have no problem saying, you're right to operate today mm -hmm. in a domain with no banisters. Where I think she would potentially differ, although I'm not sure, mm -hmm. is that in, in a domain with no banisters, you must, um, you, your, your responsibility as an artist is to um, try and create uh, a common language, a common world. Like I heard someone say once that a good building tells you how to enter it. Uh-huh. Uh, that's, that's good architecture. You, you, it tells you how to come in. I guess that's the idea.